Well, last week we started Leviticus. We looked at the first of several offerings we're going to look at together. And uh, maybe you remember more, uh, I hope, but if you remember anything, my guess would be that it was weird. And you may be wondering, what are we going to look at this morning? We're going to look at a different sacrifice, and it's going to be equally weird to us. And so that might be one thing you're wondering. Another thing you may be wondering is, what do these kind of sacrifices have to do with eating a family dinner together. Was that just a random video that we just showed? Well, no, it will play into it. This this text that we're going to look at in Leviticus 3 does uh, actually play into a, a family meal. Maybe not literally in your house, but we're going to share the Lord's Supper together at the end of the service, and there are very many uh, connections between what we're going to do in Leviticus 3 and that concept of, of eating together. And before I read the text this morning, because there are some strange things. We saw last week in the burnt offering, or I told you the, the word uh, literally in the Hebrew means ascension. It is the ascending offering. We saw blood splashed on the sides of the altar, the animal sacrifice. Uh, we're going to see some other strange strange things today. And and I just want to say before I read it that maybe we shouldn't think of their culture as weird. Maybe we're the weird ones. You know, maybe it just depends on your perspective. Everyone is going to think that something very different seems a little strange. I mean, take for example, uh, we can probably think of the 1970s. There were some weird things in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, I think of shaggy carpet. What were we thinking with shaggy carpet? Uh, or uh, just all, all the hairstyles, the, the large afros, the bell bottoms, the, all those things. Uh, people especially younger than me, and, and I did live in the 1970s, but I don't actually remember. I just know kind of from pictures. I just barely made it. I was born in October of 1979. But, uh, but, but we have people here who certainly remember living through all the weirdness of the 1970s, and, and yet when you were there, when you were living through it, uh, it didn't seem weird. You know, it was just what was trendy at the time, what was cool or of course, at the time, you would have said what was groovy, all right? Even our, our language was, was a, a different and strange. And, and that's just the 1970s in our own, in our own country. We would have thought uh, that we think today that was weird. Back then, it was normal. Well, how much more so if we're talking about a group of slaves leaving Egypt 3,400 years ago, there's going to be a lot of big differences in how we think about Animal sacrifices, just the idea of slaughtering an animal, what to do with the animal, uh, what seems strange to us and is foreign to us, and we don't deal with these kind of things, it would be perfectly normal to them. We would have a number of things in our culture that they would think are just downright weird, and I'm going to point out some of those in a little bit, but let's go ahead and read our text. It's Leviticus 3, verses 1 through 5. The, the next offering we're going to look at or sacrifice is the fellowship offering. Leviticus 3, 1 says, If your offering is a fellowship offering, and you offer an animal from the herd, whether male or female, you are to present before the Lord an animal without defect. You are to lay your hand on the head of your offering and slaughter it at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall splash the blood against the sides of the altar. From the fellowship offering, you are to bring a food offering to the Lord, the internal organs and all the fat that is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which you will remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's sons are to burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering that is lying on the burning wood. It is a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord." Let's pray together. Dear God, as we approach this text, your word, God, may, may your voice clearly be heard, your presence known. May you invite us evermore into your presence to know what it is to be with you, to live with you, to have your spirit living in us, that it, it might change us and impact us today, that we might uh, have a heart and passion to see others come to know your presence in a powerful way. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, there are a number of similarities that we can point out right away between this offering and the offering we looked at last week. Just like last week, there is an animal chosen without defect. Uh, It is slaughtered. Uh, Hands are laid on the animal, which 
is a picture of investing some of our own identity in the animal. The animal is going to represent us uh, in some fashion. Uh, the blood from the animal is collected and splashed on the sides of the uh, altar. Uh, and so all of these things are similarities. However, there are some key differences, uh, some very significant differences. Obviously, the name is, is different. We're not talking about the ascending or burnt offering. We're talking about the fellowship offering. And the word fellowship offering, shlami, is the same root as shalom in Hebrew. So very often it is translated peace offering. And it can be translated fellowship or peace offering. We'll look at why they're, they're connected uh, in a bit. Uh, the text says that you may offer either a male or female, it says in verse 1, for the fellowship offering. That's different. Last week we looked at the burnt offering. It was only a male could be sacrificed for that offering. Now why can you offer a female as well for the fellowship offering? I don't know. I have no idea the significance of that. There probably is something. But I, I think the point here is that even the type of offering you bring, the kind of animal, the gender of the animal can, can be different. So this is a different kind of sacrifice. Uh, when we look at this, the biggest difference about this offering is that verse 3 says, you are to bring a food offering to the Lord, and then there's a specific part of the animal. From the kidneys the liver, and the fat surrounding the kidneys and the liver. And why would you take that part out of the animal? Because that would be considered the choicest part, the most important, significant part that you're going to give to God. Now, today we probably wouldn't say that that's the choicest part. Certainly the kids here probably would not say the liver is the choicest part, but that's how their culture uh, would think about that and uh, uh, would, would take that out. And all of this... Seems strange to us, but, but why would you take a portion of it out? Well, you're going to take a part of it and burn it on the altar, unlike the burn offering, which sometimes is called the whole burn offering. It's called that because the entire animal is burnt up on the, in the whole burn offering. Here, you're only taking a portion of the animal, and another portion is given then to the priests. Leviticus 7 gives more information about that. Uh, and then some of the meat is going to be taken and the offer, the worshiper themselves will get some of that meat and eat it together. Eat it either with their family, their household, eat it while the priests are eating in the temple, eat it while, in some cases, the part taken for God is burning on the altar. And all of this is meant to create a picture. It is meant to do something actually meaningful. It is as if... When you are eating part of that animal and part of that animal is going up into the presence of God and the priests are eating that meal, it's as if you're all sitting down together at a table and you're eating, you're sharing a meal together. In fact, that's why this is called the fellowship offering. Now, when we look at this and we think of finding uh, in this slaughtered animal the kidneys and the liver and pulling them out, this is, this is gross, I'm sure, to many of us, uh, unnecessary, sounds ritualistic, sounds bizarre. Um, but we have to understand that, that how people thought about food in ancient times, especially meat, is going to be very different from how we think about food. And in fact, uh, how we think about food to almost every culture that has lived in the history of the world up until very recent times, and the, until the last about 70, 80 years, has, has just been completely foreign to how we think about food. Uh, and, and so, for example, it, we can, when we're hungry, maybe we're in a rush, we're on our way to something, and we say, you know what, I need to grab a bite to eat. And so we might pull up to the drive through window at McDonald's. I don't really go to McDonald's hardly ever, but maybe that's where you go and you might get a hamburger. You might uh, get, get some kind of hamburger, Big Mac at McDonald's, and you don't even have to get out of your car. You just drive up to the window in your car. You have someone hand you a bag of food. You just flash your credit card, and you might say, I'm, I'm on my way to a meeting. I've got to eat up this hamburger um, before I get to my meeting, and that's all you think about it. And you don't even know who cooked the food. It wasn't the, the person that handed you the bag. It's someone else in the back. You have probably never met them, have no idea who they are. You don't know what they might have done with the food while they were preparing it. You don't know where the meat came from. I mean, how long ago was the cow slaughtered? Uh, where in the entire world did the cow live? You don't know. 
uh, who drove the truck that had all the frozen prepackaged uh, uh, pieces of meat? Who drove that truck? You don't know. Uh, you don't know hardly anything. No human being even had anything to do with the slaughter of that animal. It was done in a factory. It's all by machine. It, the, the cow is loaded onto the beginning of the machine, and, and the machine does everything else, the butchering, everything. This is not how ancient people would have ever thought of food or would have made any sense to them. If you lived in, in a culture like the ones that are, are being addressed here uh, in Israel, uh, you would probably know the animal that you're eating. I mean, not like a pet. You wouldn't have it a name for it. But you would remember when, uh, oh, you know, next door the neighbors. I remember it was three summers ago. Their, their cow was born. You know, the, you, you would have some kind of familiarity with the animal. You would know uh, the person who butchered it, either yourself uh, or maybe someone in the town you knew or the town butcher or the priest. You would have personal contact with the person slaughtering uh, and butchering it. You would be familiar with the parts of the animal and how it's prepared. Uh, and once it was butchered, you need to prepare it. You need to cook it. There aren't all the preservatives and everything else. And so you're going to have to go through the process, taking the time of cooking, preparing that meal. And so by the time all that's done and you understand the process and you're not so removed from all of it, this is going to be a special occasion. When you're going to sit down and eat meat, it's going to be a moment of fellowship. It's going to be a time where you're going to take your time, you're going to talk with each other, you're going to uh, really build community there. It's one of the things missing a lot in our culture, especially our families. Um, just having that time you set aside to sit down and eat together is meant to be a time of really building uh, that, those relationships. And so ancient people would have never dreamed of just eating something quickly on the go, a piece of meat, without putting any significance to it uh, all by yourself. Uh, but ancient people also viewed it very often as connected to their religious practices. Even in Roman times, uh, the Romans would usually sacrifice an animal that they were going to eat in a pagan temple, and they would then eat in the temple, and meat would be associated with uh, having some kind of fellowship with their deity with the gods. And so we read in the Bible in the New Testament warnings against eating meat offered to idols and eating at the table with them. We're going to look at some of those passages uh, in a few moments. But, but these are all things that would have been in the Israelites' mind that when they bring the fellowship offering, it is a meal that connects you with God. Now, there's one other thing I want to point out that's different about this offering. Verse 5 of our text says, It is on the altar, or where you offer it, you are to burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering that is lying on the burning wood. So picture this. You have your altar. You first do the burnt offering. The burnt offering is on top of the altar. And then on top of the burnt offering, you put your fellowship offering. What does that signify? Well, last week we looked at the burnt offering, and all of these sacrifices point to Jesus in various ways. Jesus is, in one sense, a fulfillment of the burnt offering in that it is an ascension offering. It is a way that you take the life of the animal, right? We, we looked at last week. It's not so much focused on killing the animal, but the death of the animal is necessary to take the blood. The life is in the blood, and you are bringing through this process, in a sense, you're bringing the life of the animal up into the presence of God. Just as Jesus died for our sins, his blood was shed, and then he ascended into heaven to be in the presence of God. And through that, because we believe in Jesus, because we are connected to Jesus, we too may ascend, in a sense, into the presence of God uh, in heaven. We are connected to Jesus, and so we are connected to God through him. That's the burnt offering. But once a worshiper enters into the presence of God at the temple, if you will, in, in, in Old Testament times through the burnt offering, now it's time to enjoy that presence and sit down and eat together, to have a fellowship, to have a time of eating with God, to enjoy being in his presence. And when you sit down and eat with God, that communicates that you are at peace. That's why this is also called the peace offering. Uh, sometimes if, if we have a sharp disagreement with someone, we might stop speaking to them. We might tell others, oh, we're, we're not speaking right now. Uh, there's, there's that distance in our relationship. Well, in biblical times, that would be how you eat together. 
You would not sit down at a table and eat at the same table with someone that you are not getting along with right now. To, to eat with someone meant to be at peace with them. Your relationship is sound. And so to be at, have a peace offering, a fellowship offering, to eat this meal with God in this sense, that would, that, that would say that there's peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 speaks about this, I believe. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith. That's like the burnt offering that's laid down. That's the foundation. We put our faith in Jesus who died, was buried, who rose again, who ascended to heaven, and through him we're justified. Now that we're seated with God in the heavenly places, we saw that text last week in Ephesians, now we have peace with God. Now comes the, the fellowship or peace offering also through Jesus Christ. So is Jesus a fellowship offering? You may recall some of the things we've said the last number of weeks about the Passover sacrifice. And remember Jesus is our Passover sacrifice. The New Testament says that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Can Jesus be a Passover sacrifice and a fellowship offering as well? Yes. Because the Passover offering actually is a type of fellowship offering. When the Bible says Jesus is our Passover lamb, he's saying he is a type of fellowship offering. And we know that because of what you do with a Passover lamb. When you sacrifice a Passover lamb, the next thing you do is you eat it. In, in a community. And so when you're eating part of the sacrifice that is presented, that right away makes it fall under the category of fellowship offering. The Passover offering or sacrifice is simply one type of fellowship offering that has a particular time in the year when you do it to remember Passover. But it is a fellowship offering. And so Jesus is a Passover sacrifice, a fellowship sacrifice. He brings us to peace with God. There are many other interesting connections about this sacrifice and Jesus. One of which I find fascinating. We learn more about the fellowship offering in Leviticus chapter 7. Leviticus 7 says, the sacrifice shall be eaten on the day they offer it. In other words, if you're going to have a meal with God and you're going to eat part of the meat, and that is in some way connecting you to God, you have to eat it the same day as the sacrifice. Or, Leviticus 7, 17 says, the, uh, verse 16 says, anything left over may be eaten on the next day. So if you don't eat it all on that first day, you can eat it on the next day. But on the third day, it must be burned up. Don't eat anything that's left over until the third day. Why not? Because it's starting to spoil. It's starting to get rotten. You're not going to have a meal with God with rotting meat. When does it begin to rot? On the third day. Our definition of when meat is going bad comes from this chapter in Leviticus. And the psalmist says in Psalm 1610, this is a messianic psalm. It's talking about what will happen when the Christ comes. It says, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. So the Messiah, the Christ, is going to enter the realm of the dead. He's going to go into the grave. He's going to be buried. Uh, the psalmist says that. But you will not, when you, when you put your Messiah, the Christ, in the grave, you will not let him see decay. In other words, by dawn on that third day, before the sun rises, before that third day begins, you're not going to leave him in the tomb anymore. That's what Psalm 1610 is saying. So when Paul writes about the gospel and says, for Christ was raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. And we wonder, what, what does he mean according to the scriptures? Where does the Old Testament say that Christ will be raised on the third day? It's, it's right here. It's based on the, the fellowship offering that we're looking at in Leviticus 3. So in, in, in every way, the New Testament is connecting us to think of the sacrifice of Jesus as being connected to these sacrifices that were going on in the temple day by day by day uh, according to all the commands that we see here in Leviticus. Now, I will go a step further. I don't believe that when we talk about these sacrifices in the Old Testament, that we're simply talking about a picture of what Jesus one day would do, or a picture even at the time of a symbol of what can happen. 
It is that. It creates a picture. It is a symbol. I believe that if you lived in these times in the Old Testament and you brought your burnt offering first, and there's the burnt offering on the altar, you are prayerfully and spiritually um, seeing a picture of your entering into the presence of God as the smoke is rising on the altar. And then you present your fellowship offering and you are saying, God, I want to draw into your presence. I want to worship you. I want to be as close to you as I can. And I know I can't just come in any way. I need to put my faith in the process you have set up to be the means by which I can safely come into your presence and enjoy your presence. And so it would be a beautiful act of worship in which the person bringing the offering knows they're drawing into the presence of God. It's a picture of that, but it's more than a picture. There's an actual reality to it. I think God has set it up this way. And we see Paul write about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is the same chapter or same place in the Bible where Paul gives us instruction on the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16 Paul writes, is not the cup of blessing for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Now, I don't believe what Paul is saying here is that the bread that we eat at communion or or the cup that we drink literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus. But Paul wants to make it clear that when we share the Lord's Supper, Something very real is happening. Something that actually connects us to the presence of God in a special way. Why? Because this is how people thought about what happened in a meal in the temple. In 1 Corinthians 10, 18, Paul writes, Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? So the very text we're looking at this morning, Paul's saying, hey, when you eat the sacrifices from the altar, you're participating in the altar. And then he goes on to draw this conclusion about what all the other pagans around are doing. He says, no, the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. In other words, if you're a pagan, you're going into the pagan temples and you're offering a sacrifice and then you're eating part of that sacrifice, you are symbolically in this ritual way eating at the table of those false gods which are really demons, but not just symbolically. Paul writes here very plainly, you actually are in fellowship with, through these meals, demonic powers. And so Paul goes on to say, you Christians should have nothing to do with that. Instead, you have the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. You're participating with the table of Jesus. In other words, in the New Testament, we see that this isn't just a nice picture of what's happening. These things actually do draw us into the presence of God in some sense that we would not have without it. It is a way that that we come together as a church, as a church family, to enter into fellowship with each other and God through these elements. Now, where, where do the elements themselves come from? Is there any connection with the fellowship offering? Yes, I believe there is a direct connection. One of the offerings we haven't looked at yet is the grain offering. It, uh, chapter 2 of Leviticus is all about the grain offering. And I'm going to just briefly summarize that offering, but it has to do with, with bread. There are different ways that you prepare it, but very often it is unleavened bread that is part of the grain, or that is the grain offering. And then there's also a drink offering, and that is described in Numbers chapter 15, verse 10. It says, also bring bring wine as a drink offering. And so when you look at how the fellowship offering was given, it was always given in connection with a piece of bread and a cup and the drink offering. And so you would present on the altar, along with your fellowship offering of meat, you'd present matzah bread, unleavened bread, and your portion of wine from your cup. And then you would take some of the bread, and you would take some of the cup, and you would eat the bread and the cup along with your meal. It's why in a Passover meal, which is a type of fellowship offering meal, there are different times where you eat unleavened bread and you drink from the cup. And it's exactly in this meal where Jesus establishes that the bread from now on represents his body and the cup represents his blood in the new covenant. And and that language is a direct connection with the fellowship offering meal. The meat may not be present, 
But there is a continuation. It's not just a completely new tradition that Jesus sets up. There is a continuation with the fellowship offering meal. And even in synagogues to this day, the Jewish people all through the centuries, even when the temple was closed, they continue to eat bread and drink from the cup at special times in any uh, synagogue service because it is viewed as a continuation. We can't have the meat of the fellowship offering, but we are continuing to do those parts of it that we can do to sort of continue uh, the ongoing work of what was going on in the temple. It was God working in his people Israel to bring them close to himself, to bring them into fellowship. And And we also, even as Gentile Christians, are continuing in that tradition. We drink from the cup. We eat the bread. And Paul is saying that in some real sense, it draws us into his very presence. So this morning, I want us to have a time where we share the Lord's Supper together. You can go ahead and get your cup. And you may, we're going to wait a few minutes before we take it. But I want to lead us in some time of prayer So if you want, you can go ahead and hold on to that bread and be thinking about what it represents. It is directly connected to the way that God presented the Israelites through faith could draw into his presence at the tabernacle and temple on earth and eat with him. And we also are called by the New Testament to continue that, to eat the bread and drink from the cup that would be associated with that sacrifice. So that God can bring us into his presence and so that we can fellowship with God himself and with each other. That's why this is such a special and significant moment. So what I want to do is just give us some time to pray about this, think about this, think about the significance of what we're doing. And more than anything, what we're doing should be in our hearts. We are desiring to come into the presence of God in a powerful way that that will shake us and shape us and change us and empower us and fill us with grace and fill us with what we need to serve him and follow him throughout the year, throughout this week, throughout this day. And we do it again and again because seeking the presence of God is the most important thing in life. So what I want to ask you to do is if you could go ahead and stand where you are. We're going to sing in a few moments. I want to lead us in a prayer time. We're going to sing the first two verses of how deep the Father's love. And then I'm going to lead us in taking this together. And you can hold that. You can prayerfully think about what it means to enter into God's presence. Maybe during this time, I welcome you. You can come up to the front. You can pray here at the altar. I want to ask, go ahead, uh, some of the church leaders, that if you could go ahead and come up to the front, be ready to pray with people. Just take your cup and your bread with you if you want to do it that way, uh, or you can stay where you're standing. Let's have a special time just thinking about this, praying about this, and worshiping together. Let, let's pray together. Dear God, I thank you so much that you have provided Jesus. You have provided a means, a way that we can come into your presence, that we can know you, that that the God of heaven and earth who knows everything about us, that you will draw near to us, that you will be in this place even now. God, may just thinking about that, that the power of your presence in this place right now, may it move us, may it it strengthen us. God, may it change us and break us and make us long to have deeper and deeper fellowship with you, God. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. I'll lead us in a moment to take this. Let's just sing together. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure.
on the night he was betrayed took bread and after he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after the supper Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Let's just join together and close in singing. There's nothing else we have to boast in. We should boast in nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's sing together. I will. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. glad you came to worship today. I, I pray God's blessings on you to leave in the presence of God, that it will continue with you throughout the week, that, that you will sense God working in your life. If, if God's leading you to make any decision today, um, if there's anything you want prayer for, uh, I'm going to be right in front after the service, right in front of the church outside here. I would love to pray with you. You also have connect cards in the pew. You can uh, just put any of your contact information on there. I'd love to reach out to you later today or this week and um, just see what God's doing in your life and, and how we can be a part of that here uh, at Florida Gardens Baptist. Uh, but God bless you. God bless your week. Uh, if you could, take your cups with you. Uh, there's trash cans by each of the exits. We'd appreciate that. And uh, we also have the benevolence offerings uh, baskets out, so don't forget about those. God bless you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back with us soon. <laughs>